hope you know is about an hour and a half of your precious time today, but I'm hoping you'll say it's well worth it. Um, as Julie said, uh, I work in the Trust um, for GP Champion for Sexual Health, and I, was do, I do some urgent care as well, and I do have accreditation as a specialist in menopause care, so that's why I'm uh, doing today's <laughs> session. Um, so, what I thought that we would do, and for about the first half hour, um, I'm going to deliver a presentation. Um, if it's okay with you, I'd ask you to kind of write down any questions um, for our interactive session that's after that. One reason is, welcome to our viewers that are kind of tuning in on the live stream, um, who can't actually physically make it here. So we'll kind of keep it nice and, and snappy as a presentation for those guys. Um, and then after we say bye to them, we definitely will have more interaction in the room. Is that okay? So this is our plan for the morning. As I say, we've, we're lucky we've got an hour and a half and we've done this session already this morning and that feels about right in timings if you're okay to share that time. Um, once we've done the presentation, we'll have a chat and then we've got some bits and bobs on the tables and we're gonna kind of have a bit of some group work. So, initially kind of dispelling some myths uh, around menopause. So what I'm gonna talk about in the little presentation here is what is the menopause and why does it happen? What are the symptoms? Some that will be very familiar to you, you'll have definitely heard about and some maybe less so. Why is it important to recognise it? Um, you know, what are the implications? How do women feel about their menopause? And where can we go for help? Because we can't think about symptoms and you know what we might be the challenges without thinking then how we might help. So basically menopause is defined um, as 12 consecutive months without a period. Um, and obviously we're talking here about um, natural bleeds, we're not talking about kind of when we don't have periods because we're on a hormone therapy. Um, you know, so this is kind of a natural thing. And medically it's known as amenorrhea. And things that, you know, like a definition that has become more well known recently, great awareness on social media and, and you know frankly you know this is why we're here isn't it because we're taking more interest in something that we call the perimenopause as well and as I say mums and grandparents and grandmas wouldn't have thought about this but this is the onset of symptoms um, the, the time between the onset of kind of hormonal symptoms to that um, menopause itself and the medical term is known as the climacteric and essentially what that means is you know, really this is the transition, isn't it, from the reproductive era of our life as a woman to that post-reproductive phase. So why do we have one? Well, actually the kind of most of our eggs, when we're in our mum's tums, is when we have the most eggs in our ovaries. So I used to kind of say that to my daughters and say, well actually, you know, you in your egg form were inside my mum, you were inside grandma that's kind of that weird connection that we have as women um, but basically by the time we get to be born we have about one or two million eggs in our ovaries having had maybe about five or six when we're before we're born and by the time we start our periods we have something like 400,000 eggs in the ovaries and you know we waste a few we use a few obviously we've got all these periods over the years by the time we get to about 50 there's only about 100 eggs left in the ovaries. And that's why the menopause happens, basically. We run out of eggs. And the, the hormones that come from the brain to kind of tell your ovaries to do their stuff, um, they kind of keep you know, sending those messages, but the ovaries are like, well, not got any eggs left. And so we don't produce as much estrogen and progesterone in our ovaries. And the symptoms come about largely because we have reduced amounts of estrogen being produced and that's often what's you know causing the symptoms. This is about when it happens now. So in the UK the average age is about 51 um, and it does vary a little bit from countries. You know developed countries tend to have it um, slightly later than developing countries. Um, but one really important point that it's absolutely normal for a woman to go through her change as we might term it um, between the ages of 45 and 55 and certainly in my clinic I've seen women who are 56 still having regular periods that's less common but it's possible it's not abnormal 
Um, and I definitely see women who've perhaps kind of consulted, um, you know, practitioners or talked to friends or thought themselves, you know, perhaps they're kind of 46, 47 and, and thought, well, I'm, I'm too young to be going through this. Well, no, it's actually normal. And remember, we said that the menopause is, is 12 months, you know, after. So actually, the perimenopause, we think probably average duration is four to eight years. Um, maybe longer, 5% of women saying that it's more than 10 years. So then when you think about that, it's definitely not too young, is it? If you're in your 40s, you might well be having some symptoms. So if about the definition then of menopause, if you're under, um, if you're kind of younger, so if you're 40 to 45, we call that an early menopause. And if you're under age 40, so about one in a hundred women, Will have their menopause before the 40 and now rather than on here me premature menopause we actually call it premature ovarian insufficiency or POI. So that's about one in a hundred will be under 40, about one in a thousand will be under 30 when they have their menopause. Obviously this now is we're talking really about spontaneous menopause. If you've had surgery and your ovaries removed, if you've had chemotherapy or radiotherapy, Obviously, these are other reasons, aren't they, why you might go through a menopause earlier than, than expected. And just to show you kind of why, you know, why is it so important? Why are we having this event today? Well, if we look at the blue, this is our organisation, and the blue is us females. We're certainly dominant, you know, and I'm feeling the power in the room of our female hormones, trust me. But, we, you know, there's lots of us, and if we look at kind of, you know, the age group we've been talking about here, then... You know, it's a significant impact potentially, isn't it, of menopause in our trust. So what symptoms are we talking about? Well, I bet if I said to you, shout me out a symptom, what would be the commonest symptom? Hot flushes. Hot flushes, yeah. But actually, as a woman, this is the only way I can show that maybe there's other things apart from being hot. Don't worry, I'm coming to the more sensible bit. I promise you, if a man showed this, I would be slated in, but I maybe can get away with it. I've never been any of these dwarves, obviously. But yeah, 80% of women will have flushes and sweats, and that's when we think about menopause and when it's perhaps portrayed on the you know programs sitcoms and things like that you know maybe that's what's portrayed so we've grown up maybe known about that but if 80 percent of women have those that of course means that one in five women don't um we know obviously we can think logically well maybe our periods start to change and that can be anything from kind of you know having periods that are less frequent so maybe you know you might have had irregular bleed before and maybe they become a little bit more erratic the cycle might lengthen it might be that you miss a period here and there and then get a heavier one it might be that you go several months without i hate to tell you but it might be that they get more frequent you know the cycle might be shorter basically anything that can happen with periods can pretty much happen but it's not normal and you should seek advice if you're getting frequent bleeding on most days of the month that isn't normal and that needs you know investigating sleep so feeling tired and lacking energy getting headaches but also migraine if you're a migraine sufferer maybe you've had them when you started your periods you know um, in teenage years or maybe you've had them through various stages of life and maybe they've settled but they might get worse around the menopause transition and that's because our estrogen levels are going up and down um, some women actually get new onset migraine at this phase and you know often as GPs you know I fully understand why some colleagues you know might want to investigate that but actually if you think about migraine and somebody did a symptom score and actually there's lots of other things then maybe it's part of menopause dry skin and itch um, hair loss so it might be the texture of your hair changes it might be thin you know you might lose hair you know you look down in the shower and you think oh my goodness i've lost all my hair or it may be that the, the texture changes formication and we have to be careful how we say that one um, but that's where you get kind of this feeling like something's crawling all over you and you know like oh my goodness have I got a book a lady shared before that you know she goes to people's houses and she's thinking oh I thought I had scabies you know um, and that's how it feels but it's not it can be like of estrogen 
and palpitations. Palpitations are relatively common. Again, not going to blame anybody if they're ordering that ECG, but if we think about it in the context of menopause, it may be that it's a menopausal symptom. And that was just slide one of symptoms. <laughs> <laughs> so there's four of these, okay? So psychological, and I would say in my clinic, probably the top thing in terms of psychological uh, symptoms that, that kind of makes women come and ask for help is anxiety. Anxiety is extremely debilitating if you've ever suffered from that. You know, it affects everything, but it could be in menopause that we might be more tearful. You know, many women say, you know, gosh, I just, this isn't me, I don't cry at things, and yet, you know, I'm crying at the TV adverts, you know? And I don't mean the John Lewis really emotional ones, I mean like the ones for, I don't know, dog food or something, you know? It's just not me. But also I feel low, I feel flat, but I know I'm not depressed, they say, you know? I know this isn't depression, but I just feel low. Tension, you know, feeling nervous and on edge all the time. Irritability, and when, you know, we're here in a work setting, you know, imagine it may not be you that's having this, but it may be somebody who's sitting next to you, you know, who's feeling irritable. Um, and loss of interest, see many women who, you know, we, we kind of tend to make that effort, you know, we come to work, but when you chat to women who are feeling like this, Maybe, you know, we're not getting to the gym, it might be because we're shattered, but it might be just because, you know, we're not even doing the fun things anymore, you know, we just have lost interest in stuff. We should talk about the bladder, and I mean, as my best friend will let you know, I never let a conversation go without mentioning a vagina. <laughs> and we've got to talk about vaginal dryness, because if we don't talk about it to, you know, each other, or our partners, or our healthcare professionals, Chances are studies have shown that maybe that healthcare professional won't necessarily ask us because perhaps they're too embarrassed too to raise that question. Not if you work in sexual health like I do, but you know, other practitioners maybe they're not used to asking that question, especially if it's like somebody that you've known for a long time who's looked after you for a long time. So this is where symptom scores come in, isn't it? So that we might be too embarrassed to say it as well, but we could write it down, okay? But many women suffer from that and it goes unnoticed. It may then obviously lead to pain on having sex, or it may actually be that you get vaginal dryness, itch or soreness, and it's just about wearing your jeans, you know, that could just become too uncomfortable. Sex is probably, as us women, we have a complex psychosexual kind of pathway. If you think about the symptoms on the sides already, sex is going to go pretty low down our list of priorities, isn't it? So sometimes it's so low on our priorities, the partner's thinking we've found somebody else, or you know we've gone off them, or maybe um, it leads to kind of other communications. We, you know, many women kind of see me, and they, you know, there's that element of intimacy that you have, uh, you know, when you, you know, like post sex, so it just draws you together in a way that perhaps just having a chat doesn't, and and they really miss that aspect of their relationship. And if you do bother to have sex, maybe the orgasm isn't as good as it was before, so why did you bother? <laughs> Cognition, okay? This is really important. If you think about the workplace, you know, if we're going through menopause and we have memory difficulties, we're not concentrating, we're not functioning in the same way. I mean, when do we perform kind of in our most, I suppose, kind of dynamic way? It might be multitasking at home, but I mean, you do think about work as being that place where kind of usually we're kind of really on it and you know many menopause may make us feel that we're just not the same that we're not achieving it the same way and we may just feel overall in a nutshell that we're just not coping so why is it important well basically all those symptoms because you know we're struggling on and so many times women are coming to see me and they've been putting up with these things and i don't just mean for a couple of months i mean perhaps years you know the delay to getting help is there. So symptoms, that's why we want to attack it. But also many women are perhaps being labelled, feels the wrong word, but maybe, you know, thinking themselves that they're suffering from stress or anxiety. And often that is, of course, being coded in the workplace as such if they've been off, but actually maybe it's menopause, you know, and it's physiological. It's going to happen to all of us. There's not no choice in this matter, is there, you know? So we should recognise mental health problems when they occur, but also recognise menopause. And of course, if you treat with antidepressants, the low mood, 
of menopause, there's actually no evidence that that treatment will be effective. So it might be missing the underlying cause and treated with something which is less effective as well. Heart health, that's another reason it's important, and we're going to talk about that in a second. Population, our population dynamics are changing. We know that we've got an increased elderly population, but actually if we think about a workforce, over the last 30 years, the greatest increases in people working have been in women that are kind of 60 to 64, or 50 to 59, and in that 60 category, this is I think 2017 data, but it's increased from 80% of women in that age group working to 41%, that's 60 to 64. So we're having to work longer and in our phase when we might be having estrogen deficiency. And also the other thing is that we're trying to juggle, aren't we? We may be, you know, kind of looking after elderly parents or relatives, aunties, uncles. We may have deferred having our babies till we were older, so we might have younger children than perhaps our parents had. And we're, they're calling us this sandwich generation, aren't they? So many, many things that we're trying to cope with. Another reason why it's important to pick up menopause is because we've got to think about our bones and we want to kind of prevent, you know, we don't want to be that kind of, um, curved elder lady, you know, we're all living longer, but it's about quality of life later. And what I would say is it's important because as the British Menopause Society really advocates, actually this is an opportunity, you know, this is an opportunity for us to reflect on our health and well-being and try and optimise what we're calling our post-reproductive health. So it's not all doom and gloom, there's lots of reasons to kind of be tackling this in a positive way. So, I showed this, and actually it's so big up here, maybe you can see, but actually, if you look at this, if I were to ask, you know, women in the street, because you're all highly trained professionals, but if I were to ask women in the street, what do you think we're going to pop our clogs with as women, what do you think they'd say? Yeah, specifically breast cancer, because that's what we worry about, isn't it? But actually, this is your figures from 2012, but my arrow shows you that actually breast cancer deaths are actually tiny. And that's because of picking it up early, amazing treatments, but actually that most of us are going to pop our clogs with cardiovascular health reasons. Um, So the whole of that kind of side really is about cardiovascular stuff. So cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in women and men, of course, and the importance of it in talking about menopause is that oestrogen acts on the cardiovascular system. And when I was kind of a, you know, first a GP or going back before a big trial that we'll discuss in a moment, I used to say to women, you know what, so our oestrogen protects us when we're kind of before the menopause, and when we go through that and our oestrogen levels fall, we start catching up with the men in terms of rates of cardiovascular disease, so heart attacks and strokes. And there was a big trial that made us doubt ourselves and think that was wrong, but actually, power observation is good and evidence has been reanalyzed, and we were right, okay? So we start having more cardiovascular disease after we lose our oestrogen. This is partly, it's complex, but partly um, because oestrogen actually acts at the blood vessel wall. And it, you know, without getting too technical, it kind of dilates your vessels, it reduces inflammation, and it, it helps to prevent the um, atheroma or hardening of arteries. The cholesterol profile tends to worsen if we you know, have lack of oestrogen at a postmenopause. So the, the kind of cholesterol that's bad for us, um, Oestrogen normally helps reduce that, and oestrogen helps increase the good for us cholesterol. So obviously if we lack oestrogen, it's going to have the opposite effect, isn't it? Bone health, we were talking about just a while ago, and, and you know, if you work in this area, you'll know how important this is as in terms of population health. And 2% of women aged 50 years have osteoporosis, um, but about 50% of women aged 80 have it. And obviously there's many other things that could be affecting us in that 30 year gap, but certainly losing our oestrogens we know is very, very critical to that process. I know more than one in three women will have an osteoporotic fracture, and the figure for men is one in five. And of course, um, fractures <coughs> in elderly women and men lead to 
morbidity, so illness, but also mortality, so deaths. We're in the workplace today, and so just wanted to have a brief, you know, chat about that. And basically, there is guidance. We're going to be discussing this a little bit more. So those that kind of were interested in the manager session but can't be here, these are the kinds of documents that we might be looking at later. And this is from the Faculty of Occupational Health Medicine, who produced some guidelines, actually because Dame Sally Davis here um, asked them to. And the workplace guidance actually does provide us as women with some hints and tips, as well as hints and tips for the men. So that's readily available online. And the other document there is a paper uh, research report in July 17 and talks about, you know, our economic contribution and how that may change. And obviously you can understand, you know, kind of um, in population terms why they might be interested in that. Um, but actually in terms of us, you know, we know that it may have a negative impact on midlife women's quality of working life and their performance. I mean, I draw you back to the multiple slides of symptoms, and it's not rocket science to think that that's going to affect us, is it? But importantly, and if you are managing, or if you're more strategic, or just anyway, it might actually reduce our engagement with work. It might reduce our job satisfaction. And evidence shows actually maybe we're not quite as committed to our organisation. I mean, goodness, that can't be true, can it? But maybe our sickness absence goes up too. And maybe actually, and I think back to women I've seen as a GP over the years who have said to me in consultation, you know what, I just think I'm just going to finish work, I'm not coping, you know, I'm just not going to do it. Now, I would approach that consultation with my knowledge now of menopause in a different way. In the past, I, like many other doctors, have thought, well, it's anxiety, it's stress. Perhaps now we're thinking, is menopause playing a part at least? So we're going to leave this video here, something we'll gloss over. But basically we said that we'd talk about how women feel about their menopause, and if I can show you that later I will. But basically, yeah, it's affecting a lot of life. You know, actually the stuff where we didn't expect to be feeling, all those symptoms, you know, about a fifth of women said, look, I, didn't, I really didn't think sleep and insomnia were going to be part of it. A, a, another fifth, I didn't think my memory and concentration was going to be affected. I, I certainly didn't think achy joints were going to be there. And, you know, more than a third of women um, actually admitted that they felt it had impacted on their work life. And despite the fact that the average number of symptoms, you'll be glad to know we don't get all of the symptoms on the list. We probably get, on average, six to seven of them. And they'll be different. You know, what one woman may experience will be different to somebody else. And that's why we talk very much about an individualised approach to menopause care. But despite all those symptoms, 50% of women just don't go and ask for any help. They're struggling on with these symptoms. And when we did ask people in a British Menopause Society survey, about a third of women hadn't really tried anything. They just kind of thought, well, it's menopause, isn't it? I'm just going to get on with it. About a quarter have tried herbal stuff, you know, that's understandable. Again, about a quarter have tried exercise as a way out. Um, and just another quarter have tried, you know, doing something with the diet. But less than one in five have tried hormone replacement therapy. Now, whether that would be different if we did the survey again today, because it's been so much, you know, it's been very topical, we're hoping that information has gone out there. But actually, this shows that actually maybe there's potential for us to be a little bit more proactive. This was the second survey in 2017, and um, again, you know, the thing that I really draw your attention to here is they asked women, but they also asked partners and families, and six in ten families want to support the women. And my immediate thought to that is, well, what about the other four? Did they not? But also that four in ten partners feel utterly helpless, you know? Is it red rag to a book? to a bull if they say to you, well, you know, is it your hormones? Well, I mean, my goodness, don't go there. But I, the other thing that's important is actually that per year, women take three or more days sick per year that is menopause related, but they're probably not sharing that it is to do with the menopause. So briefly, I'm just going to talk through <clears throat> about what can we do about it, because we'll have more chance for those of us in the room to talk a little bit about this on the interactive stuff, and for those online, there'll be lots of resources that you can look at. 
But basically, yes, it's confusing. We've gone from HRT attack, you know, kind of it's really bad for us, it's really good for us, and then you know it's somewhere in the middle. Uh, you know, at one stage, you know, let's so good, let's put it in the tap water. But actually, it should be an individualised approach. And we know after that WHI study that basically HRT prescribing went down drastically, and you can see how prescribing has fallen away. But it's really important to say that that WHI trial, Women's Health Initiative trial that was published in 2002, actually was looking at a different group of women. We've already said the age of women that are going through these symptoms on the whole, but this study, the average age of women was 63, and they were being started on a very different kind of hormone that we rarely prescribe these days. And actually the trial was stopped early, there was a lot of scaremongering, because they thought that maybe, you know how we said before about heart attacks and strokes, they thought, oh gosh, does HRT cause heart attacks and strokes? And that study has been, you know, the data has been reanalyzed and further, the women in the study followed up longer. And no, there was no significant increase in cardiovascular events found or in deaths from heart disease in all age groups. And so we talk about a window of opportunity Actually, it's really good to be thinking about hormone replacement around the time of the perimenopause. So within 10 years of your last period, or within or under the age of 60, and the reason is that actually HRT is shown to be beneficial to your cardiovascular system if started then. Obviously, it's got to be individualised approach, and this is a sensitive topic because we all either as you know, no people may have had breast cancer ourselves because it's very common. One in eight of us in our lifetime will have breast cancer. But survival rates have improved dramatically in the last 40 years, and two out of every three women diagnosed will survive their disease beyond 20 years. And it's obviously the major genetic risks, but actually smoking is so important with breast cancer. BMI, if your BMI is 30 or over, it significantly increases your risk of breast cancer. Alcohol, I hate to tell you, but it is important with breast cancer risk, and no, not in a good way. Exercise is protective. Did you know that if you do two and a half hours of moderate exercise per week, you reduce your risk of breast cancer by more than HRT will add to it, by the way. It's really important that we eat a healthy diet if we're going to prevent ourselves. It's all about antioxidants, not got time to go on about that now, but lots of the resources that you have online will. And I show this one because that's about stress management. It's meant to kind of hint at mindfulness, but we know that stress is bad for us, you know, but it's also a cancer risk. Breastfeeding is protective, so if we did that, had the opportunity to do that when we were feeding our babes, then that was protective. So we know that oestrogen only therapy is either neutral to breast cancer risk or possibly slightly reduced. And the idea is that maybe when we add progesterone, for those of us with a womb and we have HRT, we've got to add the progesterone bit, and that's the bit that is linked to breast cancer. But it's thought that it promotes a cancer that was going to happen rather than it kind of actually causing it. It's associated. And the type of progesterone we use is, is important, and we're learning more about that as we go on. And you might say to me, well, what is HRT? Well, it's pills, patches, and gels. And progesterone, again, pills, patches. Um, we sometimes pop progesterone into the vagina and also into the womb as the marina. And local estrogens, if you are um, don't, not interested or maybe have, you know, not, not considering systemic HRT, then it's not to say that you might not benefit from local estrogens, which are really important for that dry vagina that I was talking about before. But when we see in GP lab, you know, eight two olds having recurrent wing infections, well, you know, if we use some local estrogens, we could probably prevent a lot of that. Testosterone, I mentioned in passing because it is part of our gamut of hormone therapies, but the vast majority of women who are on HRT uh, won't need the addition of testosterone to help libido, energy, etc. Some women might, if they've had um, their ovaries removed, they're more likely to need testosterone. This is a slide just showing if we're not considering hormones, some women obviously can't have them, and these would be other things that we may go to, some of them more about kind of benefiting flushes with sweats, um, and obviously, you know, maybe some of those 
uh, psychological symptoms in a woman who can't have estrogen or doesn't choose to. We shouldn't forget about kind of psychological therapies, so CBT can be very helpful. And already we've hinted at why managing our stress may be important in our overall well-being, which we know, don't we? Nutrition, chickpeas there because legumes, beans and peas have uh, basically what we're doing here is we're eating estrogens, but plant-based estrogens. It's important to eat the rainbow so we have lots of different colours of fruit and veg and have lots of greens and not have too much caffeine because that's going to make our flushes and sweats worse. A wide range of exercise important, so from weight bearing, cardiovascular, something fun, something restorative that helps us to breathe. And sleep. Really, if I had all day, I'd talk to you about circadian rhythms, an amazing area of science, and developing science, but you know, read up about that. DrChatterjee.com is on the hints and tips, and he has podcasts, and you will hear about circadian rhythms if you look in there. And relax, yeah, well, wine may be cheaper than Botox and paralyze more muscles, but no, we've already said that's a risk factor. Maybe in moderation, that's okay. But we don't need to be in a position to be doing some mindfulness. You could do it in a queue or um, whatever. But actually having some fun is important. We said before that we must, you know, let's not be these women that are kind of putting up with these symptoms and not doing anything. It may be, it's got to be tailored to you. So have a look at Menopause Matters, the website. There's women's health concern where there's lots of leaflets. Um, and they're here, you know, this is about hopefully you're going to be able to go and see your manager. This is peer support. So, you know, in uh, up and down there are menopause cafes and that's one of our discussions, you know, would it be helpful in, a, in the workforce to have it? Obviously, go to see a healthcare professional. And um, there's something that there's other websites which are online. And let's hope that you know we're coming out of that dark kind of place if we're feeling like we've got all these symptoms and we can approach the light that is doing something about